Hello and welcome to the Talk from the Terrace podcast on both Celtic Fanzine TV and on audio on the Celtic Soul podcast. Please hit that subscribe and follow button so you never miss an episode. And in this episode, I'll be joined again by Matt McGlone, Celtic fan, editor of the Alternative View, author of Emotionally Celtic, and the founder of the Celts for Change back in the 1990s. Hi Matt, you're very welcome back to the show. It's been a busy period since last we spoke, two games a week, playing league, league cup and European games coming thick and fast. Yeah, it has. And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, I think we've made great progress. I mean, since the start of October, including November and a couple of games in December, we've achieved uh, 25 league points from uh, a possible 27, which is which is good. Uh, it's very good, considering Ange only kicked off and started the team from a blank canvas at the start of the season. You know, we've also, um, in the in the October, November, picked up, and obviously part of December, picked up 15 away points out of 15, which was always a problem. It's a problem last season, it was a problem this season. And uh, I think it began to get a wee bit psychological with the players. Um, but now we're playing free-flowing football at Parkhead and away from home. And I felt at Tannadice on Sunday there, I mean, Celtic were relentless. Uh, you know, the 3 0 scoreline didn't really do justification to the display. No, it didn't, Ma. Um, excellent uh, performance from, from start to finish, from, from, from back to front. I think Joe had made made one little error early on, but he made a men's a good save as well in the second half. But it, it's been it's been the story of um, a lot of the games were, were just so dominant, and I think we were due to put a few goals past someone. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of stats flying around these days with new technology, and I saw one uh, the other day there, which was uh, pointing out that. Uh, per ratio of chances, how many points or how many goals you should score from per ratio of chances and how many points you'd collect at the end of the season. And per ratio of chances that we have, if they were turned into goals, you know, it said that we'd win the league by 14 points or so. But that's the problem. We're not turning those chances uh, into goals, but we're still winning games. So there's not a complaint there. It's not a complaint. But you just like to see all the good work uh, through the skillful, good play rewarded with tankings. I mean, Dundee and I should should have been hit for six or seven easily at the weekend without exaggerating. Uh, And they're great confident boosters for for teams, Uh, not for Dundee United, obviously, but for Celtic. Um, So the fact that we are creating chances is good. Um, The fact that we're not converting as many as we're creating, maybe not so good, but overall, no complaints. Yeah, and we've European football guaranteed after Christmas in the new competition, the Europa Conference League, or whatever they call it. And Torsi's game may give the manager a chance, Matt, to rotate the squad because, let's face it, we have a more important game on Sunday. And it's not so often you can say that when you have a big European game, but Motherwell is a, is a must win. Yeah, well, as you know, my thoughts on this, Andrew, I've been pretty regular on this point of view. I felt that um, with Ange starting fresh this year to get a team together I felt we could have done without Europe for me the priority is the Premier League to get our championship back that's the priority I feel that these other games were getting in the way um, so the, the you know the Conference League <laughs> nobody really knows what it is because we've never really had it before I suppose it's just another watered down version of what the Europa, Europa League is but you know, the fact that we have just got a new team together and Ange has really only rotated 11 to 14 players and in most games, the same 11, 12 have started. These guys have been playing twice a week, flying in, flying out of countries, preparing for games against teams, say, like Aberdeen, um, just after Leverkusen there. Um, you know, we, we get back in the early hours of the Friday morning. They've been sitting with their feet up all week and preparing for one game at the weekend. We've been preparing for another game in between. That ultimately will take its toll, there's no doubt about it. Footballers are not robots and uh, you can't squeeze the best out of them all the time when they've always been squeezed dry. So, yes, this Thursday, um, I think we should really rotate the squad. I think we should see five or six changes. Um, as you say, priority is Motherwell on Sunday, three more points towards the league. 
Yeah, and back back to Dundee, Matt, on Sunday. Uh, I was on one of the unlucky ones that um, got me ticket in the Jerry Care stand. So, in the end, I didn't travel. There was, there was you know, the phone was hopping. I'm, see, what, did I have a ticket? But, um, didn't storm damage, as it says. And I had the pleasure of watching the game at home with um, Chris Boyd on Sky. And it was lovely to see Chris uh, seeing Celtic play so well. Um, you know, and... Just to see that face, but um, when I was like, it was one of those games I did enjoy on TV because last season not so much. Um, I was, sometimes I was dreading um, watching the games last season because it was just so poor at times. But there was a certain togetherness. You could see Anne celebrating each goal. The players that were enjoying it. There were three magnificent goals, especially Rodgers, a contender for goal of the season. And after the game, you know, Angie's he, he's gone to the fans and he's he's acknowledged them and they've acknowledged him. And there's a lovely togetherness. But then it's at the backdrop of the whole Bernard Higgins thing. You know, so... Like, yeah, well, like, well, and the, well, two points there. You know, the first one, uh, Ange... Um, I don't, know, I don't know how you describe it. You got to be careful what you say. It's almost like man love. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, fans just love Ange because he identifies with what we're about. He also identifies and gets what we're into as far as chasing this championship. Remember this guy's came from the other side of the world. He hasn't been immersed in what we've been immersed in all our all entire lives. But he gets it. And when you get it and the fans um, identify with the manager, there's a great unity there. Uh, and I think this season, I was just sitting right in my editorial for the Alternative View magazine last night, and I was saying to myself, if we win the cup against Tibbs, I'll be as pleased for Ange individually as I'll be pleased for ourselves, the fans, because it's all about the fans who want to win and the players. But for Ange, there's got to be a special warmth there that this guy's come in, done all the right things. He's been in a storm all the time. He's hardly had a chance to draw breath twice a week, but still get it right. And if he lifts this trophy, you know, I'll, I'll be personally really chuffed for that guy. Um, I, I think he's a, a brilliant guy. I think I think the way he conducts himself in interviews. <laughs> there was a funny one a couple of weeks ago. The guy, obviously looking for a headline, asked Ange what he thought about the Hibs moaning about their ticket allocation when they barely have ten thousand people at their home game. If it's out with the, the two from Glasgow, and then they get seventeen and a half thousand. I think there's a couple more thousand if I'm not if I'm incorrect there. Um, and he just says, look, mate, he says, don't ask me about things like that. He just bursts out laughing. He's not interested. You know, whereas before, uh, previous managers uh, might have got drawn into that question. He just wasn't having it. You know, he says, uh, you know, we're here to talk about the Leverkusen game. You know, I'm not here to talk about how many tickets Hibs get. On the Bernard Higgins things, this is a bad, bad idea with Celtic. Um, now, you think that any... Um, Suppose the BLC are going to look at us as a business. We, we look at it a bit more than a business. It's a bit more a way of life and not quite a business. But if you want to say it's a business because they have to turn over certain amounts of money to make things happen and buy players, then okay. Um, but I don't know any other group, business, company who would alienate themselves from their own supporters. I, I don't get that mentality. And I've thought about it. I said, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to alienate yourself from the people that actually feed you? The, the people that love the club and put the money in. Why would you want to do that? So I couldn't make any sense of that. And I still can't. But I think the reason is, I, I knew the PLC were out of touch with the groundswell of support of the fans. I didn't know they were completely removed from it. It seemed to be. Now, yeah, 100% now. Matt. You know, the problem we seem to have now is that um, the Higgins appointment, I would think, I don't have any evidence of this, but I would think it was probably quite far down the line contract-wise between Celtic and him and with the uproar of the fans and the outcry, because this isn't going to go away. Now, you'd have to be extremely stupid to be on the Celtic board just now and think you're just going to appoint Higgins 
and this is going to go away. It isn't going to go away. Uh, the fans have made up their mind that they're going to be protesting. And the last thing Ange wants or needs is any interruptions or sideshows. Now, the Higgins thing is very important, and the fans are correct to protest. Absolutely, 100%. But Ange will be looking at the fact that we're heading for the league, and he doesn't want any sideshows going on here. So Celtic need to solve this situation. I would think they're probably quite far down the line. Um, the chairman bank here said at the AGM that he wouldn't comment on it um, when he was asked about the appointment. Does that tell you that Celtic have probably given uh, Mr. Higgins a contract and that uh, they're duty bound to pay it to him, um, whether he starts or not? I can't, I can't see him starting. I, I don't think anybody in the PLC board is stupid enough to give to give Bernard Higgins a start. Not with the way the groundswell of the support are feeling about it. Yeah, Matt, and it is growing. Um, at the start, people were, you know, th- there was the ultra groups, the Celtic Trust, you know, had had brought her out in the open. But since then, the amount of people I've spoken to from all walks of life who have come in and went, no, 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 this, this is, this is crazy appointment, you know, and it's it always seems to be Matt when there is starting to be some unity between fans, management, team, that that we score a known goal. It happened when the chief executive was was removed or left his job or whatever earlier in the season after only a couple of weeks because he, he, he'd kind of come in, he'd done the fans' press conference, he'd spoke about what changes he wanted to do, he spoke about best practice. So, you know, there was, there was backing of him, let's give him a chance. And then he's gone... You know, within a couple of couple of weeks, and then this comes along now, and I just think that you know how how, how often is this board going to score own goals? No, th- this appointment can't go through um, because you're going to have several war at Celtic Park, and we're trying to win a league here. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line here. We need unity. Um, but is it the case that Celtic have got a contract already set with this person? and that uh, they're wondering what to do now. Um, because if he has, uh, as far as I know, I think he retired after COP26. Um, so if he was ready to step into this job, I would imagine all the paperwork and contracts would have been put in place prior to this. Uh, so if that's the case, uh, there's a bitter lesson there for the Celtic PLC that uh, if, the, if that's the situation, they're going to have to pay the guy and not employ him. Um, because as you say there, no, we don't need uh, bad feeling amongst the fans. We need harmony. We need a feel-good factor. We've got a feel-good factor. That's hard to achieve. To have a feel-good factor is very difficult to get. We've got that. Why would you want to blow that up? I don't get it. I really, I, the, the, the PLC must be so far out of touch that they, they're not reading the room at all. Um, you can't have the fans constantly protesting um, against a board who are making an appointment for all the wrong reasons. The fans are right to protest, absolutely no doubt about it, because I've heard some of the horrendous stories that have <clears throat> happened here. Um, but we, we, uh, overall, we can't continually have this. Um, so Celtic, it's Celtic's move to sort this, not the fans' move to stop it. The fans will carry on. You can see that. You can see the intents there. So it's up to the club to sort this out and stop this happening and get complete 100% harmony and unity <clears throat> back into the entire stadium. Here, here, Ma. Um, I think it's a it's a story that's going to rumble on until we get a um, no, decision from I mean, the board. And I do believe that idea was done or is done because I heard a whisper coming from outside of Satley Park last week from someone that was in at a meeting so uh, didn't comment yeah, much on it but I, I did ask and I didn't get much back but he did basically say that mm-hmm. yeah there's definitely a, a deal in the pipeline mm-hmm. or a deal done so but I hope yeah, sure. I, I hope I'm wrong Matt because you know you would imagine, you'd imagine the way business works these days one guy leaves a job he's retiring out of that into a high profile job at Celtic uh, talks have been done and uh, contracts signed. You know, you wouldn't be signing the contract today to start the job. The contract could be set in motion weeks previously. 
So you probably, you know, we're both probably thinking the same thing, although we don't know um, that the contract has been done. Celtic's problem is just now, uh, how do we gracefully exit this situation? They won't be wanting to think that the fans have got a great victory. Um, and they know they can't employ Bernard Higgins, and they know there's probably a contract there. So I would think that their plan just now is how do we get out of this with grace and uh, saving face? Yeah, but you see, it's not about handing the fans a victory, Matt. And this is well, this is what you know, this is what pisses me off. Like it, it's about right and wrong here, you know. Like no, no, yeah, no. no football fan in Scotland. No, no, I, I totally, would want I totally this man you. appointed after what he done. You know. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree with you. It's, it's not about uh, handing the fans a victory, but that's the way the PLC will view it. That's the way they'll view it. Um, now, the bottom line is right and wrong, correct, and um, the right thing has got to be done here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I would think. Sitting thinking, how does Ange, what does Ange think about this situation? Ange must be saying to him, Look, what's the background to this? Tell me the background. Because I think Ange is the kind of guy who would want to know everything that's going on at the club. Um, if the fans are staying silent in the Green Brigade area for 30 minutes for a game recently, there, he'll want to know why that is. So Celtic will have had to have filled them in. Um, so he'll want this sorted as soon as possible. The very fact he hasn't been appointed, I think, tells you how this is going to go. Yeah, I'm just my biggest fear, Matt, is that you know we go out, we win the cup, we have the feel good factor, and then within 24 hours they appoint them, you know, because that's the sort of uh, stuff they do. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see that happening, but well, <laughs> no, no. Listen, listen, Matt. On the happier times, uh, you're away. Matt, I didn't bump into you in Cologne. I knew you were there. Joe Cook had um, sent me a text, but I was getting into my bed. Um, I was staying about four stops from the city centre, and the first night when I get in, I says, I'll have a look around um, the, lo- the local area before I go into the city centre. And I found a little music bar with a little... So uh, that that done me for the for the evening. But I did get into Cologne on the day of the match. A wonderful city, Matt. And I have to say, Germany... Should should we not hold all major competitions, Dale? Fifteen quid for a ticket. Free trains with your ticket. On time trains, football specials. A, a, a police force that stood back and you know allowed drinking at the tone styles. You know, whereas I seen lads who were you know pretty drunk, but they weren't getting lifted. They were being told by their friends, you know. Get them off, so get them sorted. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was just, it was just so refreshing. Take a price, travel, the city itself. Like you know, it's not very often you get to, you know, to enjoy a pre-match in, in Christmas markets uh, with carol singers uh, and mulled wine. Yeah. So, how did you get on? Well, let's right go. Let's go right back to the beginning here, Andrew. Uh, when I met Joe Cook, because <laughs> he said you were still in your bed. I met Joe Cook at ten o'clock at night. I was going to bed. And, and <laughs> you were going to bed. Who goes to a away game in Europe goes to bed at 10 o'clock at night? Come on. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to get up early to enjoy the Christmas markets. Listen, I, I've had some eventful trips away from home. 1986, Kiev, P. Glasnost and Perestroika. Um, Kenny McCluskey, the singer from the Bluebells. Him and I went out for a walk. We were sharing the room. And we get kidnapped by the KGB and told to sit in the back of their car. Um, for over two and a half hours. Um, so don't just get to a bed at 10 o'clock that day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the only way we get out of that situation was um, the the Russian guy who sat there with the driver in the car said to Kenny and I asked his various questions and Kenny said he had been a musician. I think he'd just probably been on top of the pops with Young at Heart, the Bluebells. And when he said he was a musician, the guy started to go like he played a clarinet. And I thought, oh, this is getting quite funny. I wonder if once the hostage situation is over, if we can go now. So I said to him, because uh, Sean Robo had kicked off just prior to that, um, it was only 60-odd miles away, 
I said, um, we Celtic had said, maybe a good idea to take your own food. So I was taking pies and brides along. And I said to the Russian KGB guy, we've got uh, special Scottish food up in the room and whiskey. He said, yes. I said, yes, we have pie and brady. What is this? I said, we have pie and brady's and, and whiskey. I said, shall we go and get you? <laughs> so we could get away. <laughs> He says, no, you go, you stay, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you, that was the funniest moment ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, last thing I heard is the door closed over was Kenny say, please come back, Matt. And I was still in a bit of shock and trauma. And I'm up to the bar in the hotel and they were serving a strawberry flavoured lager. All the hotels had the same name. They're called In Tourist, and there was happened to be In Tourist Thirty Six. And all the Celtic fans were in the bar. A guy came up and said hello to me. I said, "Hang on, I need to get a pint." Get a pint. <laughs> this guy poured me a um, pint of strawberry strawberry flavoured lager, and I necked it in a winner. And he said, "Where have you been?" I says, "I never believe this." I says, "Listen, I need to go anyway." So I bombed up to the room, got the pint of brady and the whiskey, came down put myself back into a hostage situation that I had already removed myself from. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't make it up, honestly. Um, and uh, anyway, so Cologne, many years later, that from 86, Cologne was wonderful. It was it was great. And um, as you know, you couldn't get into a coffee shop, to a bar or a restaurant without showing your double vax passport along with your... ID, passport, driving licence. They had it all very well sussed out. Uh, we stayed in Cologne. There was about eight of us all together, uh, myself and two of my sons and other friends. And uh, a friend over here, Chris O'Neill, um, has got a pal who's a Bayer Leverkusen fan. And he said, Matt, there's a Bayer Leverkusen supporters club right across the road from the stadium. Fancy getting there. I said, well, we'll see what it's like in you know, Leverkusen itself. As you know, it's quite small. Yeah. It's not, not a big place, not an awful lot of pubs. So the train service, as you say, is fantastic. It runs right through the night as well. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we went into Leverkusen. We were in a pub and it was absolutely jam-packed. I mean, <laughs> if there was any COVID scientists in there, <laughs> they would have collected quite a few specimens, I'll tell you. <laughs> because the place was like that. And it was hot. Um, so my friend suggested that they buy a Leverkusen club across from the stadium. And uh, five or six of us went there. And we were made most welcome. It's absolutely brilliant. We sat down, brought beers over to the table and served as a meal. And we popped back in there, uh, coming out after the game. No crowds, no rush. Stayed there till about midnight. And uh, I'm being the older of the lot, saying, well, we time to go to get a train out here. And my kids are saying, that's ah, fine to run through the night, Dad. So, um, yeah, wonderful place, Cologne. I hear a lot of fans have a great time in Dusseldorf as well. Yeah, I, I I was in Dusseldorf when we played Leverkusen, and it was it was again another another uh, not Leverkusen when we played uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach. That was our base that time. Yeah, and another great city. I thought that um, I thought Cologne was was brilliant, and I, I met Mark Borg from Nave Park, an old an old Celtic stalwart. You'd, you'd know Mark from the Cells for Change days, and I met Mark in a bar after, and. We did stop serving drink because a couple of Celtic fans were too noisy and they closed the bar. But we left and we were, we were heading back to where the hotels were. And um, as we crossed the road, Mark says, "You know," he said, "This is the first European bus trip named Park ran in 1992." And I was thinking, it was long enough to get here between driving to the airport and flying over. I, I salute those boys from that bus in 1992. Well. Well, I, I tell you, driving Max from Dublin, and uh, I take his bus came from Dublin um, because the supporters' club runs from there. That must have been a bit of a journey. Um, I went to Bremen in the late eighties, um, and it was on a guy called Brian Connors' buff bus. His nickname was Biff. Biff's a bit of a legendary figure in the Heritage Bar in Glasgow Southside, and uh, Biff ran a bus from uh, Heritage to Bremen. And said it would take about 18 hours. So um, 24 hours later, um, we're driving through fog 
um, six hours beyond when we should have been arriving. And everybody's saying, where are we, where are we, how long is it going to take to get here, what's happening here? And he said, oh, shut up, shut up. And one of the guys in the bus is holding a, like, a diary, and the inside of the diary he's got a, a map of Europe, which is about that size. <laughs> <laughs> He says, he says, no, we're definitely in Germany. And somebody looked out the window through the fog. And I kid you not, I'm not making this up. Three women were standing waving at the bus next to a windmill with wooden shoes on. And they says, we're not in Germany, we're in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> we eventually got there at four o'clock that afternoon. And uh, there was a whole bus there. And for some reason, when we checked into the hotel... I mean, we literally lost the day. We checked into the hotel. Um, the guy said, I want one person out of the group to be called the, repon- the responsible person. And I'm looking around, everybody's looking around, they're all pointing at me. And I said, I'm not going to be the responsible person for you lot. you kidding? <laughs> so anyway, it turned out I was. And uh, there was various things that were on the hotel that night. But I have to tell you a very quick story. This is very true. We found out where the team were playing. We are staying, actually. And um, I was running Paul McSay's fan club in the, in the mid-80s. And Paul and I still are great friends to this day. And uh, I said to Paul, any chance a couple of lads could nip in the team hotel and get some pictures? He said, I know, boy, I can pop in. So uh, the couple turned into about eight or nine. And as we all sat down, as you know, in Germany, they just bring you a drink over. You don't have to ask for one. You know, you have to put your, your beer mat on top of your glass to say you don't want a drink. That's what happened in Cologne. Anyway, this couple of barmaids came over and they put down nine large beers and we scoffed them. And then she came over again, put down nine large beers. This went on about eight or nine times where we are still sitting chatting to the Celtic players. So they all went off to their rooms and et cetera, and we're all sitting there getting absolutely tanked. And uh, all the bar staff disappeared. So he said, oh, that's great. Must have been three beers tonight. So we all took off out of the hotel. And uh, when I get back, <laughs> Paul phoned me up and he said, by the way, he says, we're going to have to deny ever meeting you guys. He said, Celtic picked up the tab. <laughs> for about 100 beers. <laughs> <laughs> now, I says, well, it was completely accidental. We'll, we'll pay the tab if that's what's to be. Um, it's completely accidental. I said, how did this come about anywhere? Anyway, and he says, I won't mention the director's name, but because he's still around, uh, not at the Celtic, but he's out of the club now. The, the, the director had got a note from the band manager saying that he didn't know all the Scottish players drank before the game and he was surprised but there's a bill for £100 for all the players <laughs> drinking 100 laggers before the match <laughs> that's, all, said, that's well, all I call a result well I said well if you look at the state of us you know some is bellies out to there some is that size that size that size surely common sense would have told you we're not players but because we walked in with Celtic gear on scarves and and the hats, you know, tracksuits and jerseys, whatever. They actually thought we were players. They just gave us all this beer for free. <laughs> I, I, I'd say they put, they put a few bob on the home team to win after seeing, after seeing the squad. Uh, well, this said director had said to Paul, um, who were these guys? Paul says, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Only the guy running your fan club. He uh, says, I haven't got a clue who they were. He says, it's just... Fans that walked into the stadium, <laughs> walked into the hotel rather. Matt, it's, it's been it's been a bonus to hear some of the European stories. Um, I, I always love to I, I love to hear fan stories, and I love to share my own as well. Um, especially to the as you know, especially a, to the younger mob. As you know, there's a lot that would never be told. No, no, no. Well, not not in public enemy, and certainly not in a podcast. Matt, um, we're back with Celtic AM on Thursday, so hopefully we'll get you um, in for a chat maybe if you're around Thursday. If not, we'll get you on another show because we'd love to have you um, in Morphy's on new home. We're moving into the smaller bar now, which is a bit more cosy, and we have it ready. It has been ready for the last thing. We were just in it last week checking it out, and it's a um, nice fire. and Nice. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, it's just... 
It's downstairs, but uh, you don't go into the back bay. It's it, it's just off to the side, and we're gonna we're gonna set up there. I'm hoping to have a few betters fans in with us, and a couple of guests will confirm the guests maybe later on or in the morning. But Matt, um, as always, thanks very much. Don't forget, folks, you can pick up the new uh, edition of the Alternative View, which I believe is going to the printers today, Matt. So that'll be out soon, and that's available in news agents around Glasgow. And more than 90 minutes, 118, our own fanzine is available in the candy store, Coat Bridge, Carlton Books, and we have about 10 copies of the print edition left. So if you want to visit our website, CelticFanzine.com, you can get one now, or you can download a digital copy if you prefer the more modern tact. Sorry, Matt, go ahead. If I can add in just um, to the Russian story there, people <laughs> Why Kenny McCluskey and I at the Bluebells ended up in the back of the KGB cars because there was a curfew on, and it meant that after uh, nine o'clock at night, around about then, nobody was to be out on the streets because we've just arrived from Glasgow. A few beers wandered out walking around, and uh, that's when the big black car drove up and asked us to get in. And at first we said no, then they, kind of <laughs> they used more forceful um, um, ways to get us in. <laughs> But that was the reason all that happened is because there was a curfew on and uh, we shouldn't have actually been walking about. Well, there you go, folks. We leave it at that. Matt McGlone, the Bluebells, Younger Heart in Russia with the KGB. <laughs> right.